Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to Facebook Live. It's 11.30, so we're going to start early today. I have to give conference at noon. Um, just back from Nashville, I got back last night. We had our four-day meeting. Um, terrific meeting. Uh, many of you are there. Not enough of you, however. And um, I think the meeting was just terrific, and uh, I know the attendees had a great time. We had just terrific speakers. Uh, Brooke Jeffrey from Stanford, Ron Zagoria from um, UCSF, Ella Kazaruni from Michigan, three of the top radiologists in the country, in the world, in the universe, gave incredible talks, four of them each. Then we had people like Karen Horton, our chair, speaking, myself, Jan Fritz, Atif Zahir. So I think just a terrific uh, uh, set of talks over four days. Also, I will say that um, Nashville is a wonderful place. We had a little bit of rain the first day, but uh, didn't slow anybody down. Uh, we, uh, the faculty went to the Grand Ole Opry, which is quite a unique event. If you've never done it, it's worthwhile to go to Nashville. And we may go back to Nashville next year. It's just an absolutely terrific city, and everyone had a good time. So we're back. I thought I would share with you today, but just to give you a little bit about what you missed if you were not at the meeting. I'm not going to show you the slides because then you should have been at the meeting, and then you would have the stick, which had everybody's presentations on it. Um, but let me just tell you a few things that you may have missed and some good points. Um, I'll take each of the outside speakers and kind of look at one of their lectures and some of the things that I learned. I think one of the important things in the way I judge a meeting is I do invite the speakers. I do choose the topics, though, obviously, in the, uh, when you're inviting someone from the outside, you kind of know what they speak about, and so you balance the program, and um, they tell me what they speak about, uh, what their, their latest and greatest stuff is, and then we fill in with the Hopkins stuff. But Ron Zagoria spoke about imaging renal infections. So if I'm looking aside, I'm looking at his presentation. And he spoke about some of the things that we, we look at. He spoke about the techniques for imaging the kidneys. He spoke about some of the advantages of uh, both ultrasound and CT. He spoke about imaging of polynephritis with the key CT findings, of course, being striations and wedge-shaped defects, the fact that you see these low densities very nicely on the nephrographic phase, but also see them very well if you look at the patient's um, excretory phase. I think we've commented in the past that probably the least effective phase for infection may be arterial phase, Usually you see things, but you may, you may not. He also spoke about uh, glomerular nephritis and nephritis in general, making comments that glomerular nephritis is typically bilateral with renal enlargement, diffuse increased echogenicity on ultrasound, typically no hydronephrosis, and for the typical or specific type of glomerular nephritis, you will indeed need to get a biopsy. He also spoke about renal infection and infected cysts, that of course certain populations are more likely to get infection, obviously immunosuppressed patients, patients who have transplants. He spoke about some of the unique infections, emphyseminous polynephritis, usually it's a diabetic patient, usually it's E. coli infection, it can be localized or diffuse, and a very, very high mortality of over 80% less aggressive management is done, and usually it's a resection of that patient's kidney. Uh, you see gas in the parenchyma, that's an emergency. Uh, that patient will get a nephrectomy. Sometimes it's very localized. You could then perhaps drain it, but invariably when you start seeing it infiltrating the kidney, that patient is indeed gonna go to surgery. He also spoke about some of the granulomatous infections, particularly mentioning TB which we used to see, remember that thing about amputated calyces and autoinfarcted kidney, which would be a small calcified kidney, but um, it's uncommon now. He did mention you can see TB, particularly if you look at worldwide travelers. Uh, TB does not respect fascial planes. Uh, you can see uh, extension into the peri and pararenal space, though often what we see at the end of the day is a papillitis or some of the uh, results of infection over time, which as I mentioned, is a small atrophic kidney. He also mentioned the infections that we've spoken about here as well, XGPs, anthrogranulomas polynephritis, large kidneys, 
staghorn calculus, hydronephrosis, occasionally can be focal rather than global, at times can mimic a neoplasm, but usually that big dilated calyces, central stone, big kidney tends to make um, the diagnosis pretty much classic. But he did mention that, and he showed a few nice examples of how focal XGP can mimic renal cell carcinoma. He also went through some of the findings in the bladder. Of course, you know, we look at the bladder all the time. Cystitis, bladder wall thickening, but of course, emphysema the cystitis. Usually it's a diabetic patient. You can see air in the entire wall. You see air in the lumen. You only see intraluminal air, of course. I'll just comment that we think about a fistula. But in the wall, you're thinking about infection. And uh, that's something, again, to, to, to really think about. And he mentioned also, just for completeness, some of the things when you're looking at the pelvis, prostate abscesses, which are indeed rare, or Fournier's gangrene, where it's all the air trapped in the soft tissues. Patients often have soft tissue swelling. And it's something we uh, see occasionally, but those patients are super sick. Okay, in, in that regard, okay, and staying, I'll stay in the abdomen first. As you know, obviously, Ron Segori has expertise in the kidney. Brooke Jeffries' expertise is everywhere, but in the abdomen, particularly pancreas, GI, liver, and then Ella Kazaruni, of course, is cardiothoracic. So Brooke was talking about some of the complications of gastric bypass surgeries. One of his excellent talks was on acute abdomen, looking at some of the challenging cases. He spoke about the problem with internal hernias, which can be confusing, but do occur in these patients with bypass surgeries. Uh, he felt that if you have a gastric bypass patient, particularly if they've lost weight, but even if they haven't, and they have abdominal pain, you better make certain that you're not missing an internal hernia. And his comments related to how do you not miss it, pay attention to the mesenteric vessels and not the dilated bowel loops. And sometimes the loops really aren't dilated at presentation, but it's where the vessels are. He spoke about the world sign of the twisted mesenteric vessels, the beaking of the SMV, mesenteric edema, tethered mesenteric vessels, the mushroom sign, the clustered loops, and sort of that crisscross appearance, and he showed very nice examples. This idea about looking at the vessels and the speaking of the SMV, he showed some very nice examples of that, particularly on the coronal view, that you can see the beaking also on the axials, but the coronal views were particularly good. He spoke about some of the other findings from mesenteric edemia, edema, to that, but that beaking of the SMV was really the thing he tended to focus on most. He showed some examples of paraduanal hernias, uh, and then some of the small bowel obstructions, particularly closed loop obstructions, and uh, mentioned, of course, the difficulty we do have in these gastric bypass patients. So that works out very, very nicely. Um, Brooke also spoke about, in general, just valvulus, that uh, valvulus are challenging diagnosis. CT is really good at detecting them, though sometimes you can make the diagnosis obviously on plain films. But as we look at more and more patients with the acute abdomen, we are going to see patients with a number of different processes, and one of them is called a sequel valvulus, or is a sequel valvulus. The importance of making sure the cecum's in the right place, not flip-flopped on the left. He spoke again about looking at the mesenteric vessels, looking at that so-called hook sign. And Brooke also spent a lot of time talking about <coughs> that when you're looking at the abdomen, particularly in the acute setting, or just in general, you need to look at the mesenteric vessels. We speak about that all the time, looking at the sagittal views for stenosis, uh, things like that, meaning ocular syndrome, SMA syndrome. But he wasn't so much focusing on the sagittal view. He was focusing on looking at the patient's mesenteric vessels across the spectrum, but particularly from a coronal perspective. Brooke also made the point that he gave up his Jeffrey's number one rule. And I'll quote it, a dog can have ticks and fleas, beware satisfaction of search. And it made the point that all of us know that sometimes when you're looking for acute abdomen or almost anything, and you find something, you're so happy, you basically just essentially almost stop looking and close the case. 
And he showed examples, for example, of a cecal volvulus with acute cholecystitis. Uh, he also had his Jeffrey number two rule. Old studies in the patient history are, for, are often smarter than we are. And again, had some very nice examples, anywhere from ulcers to metastasis. He showed a nice example of a med to the gallbladder, which was uh, metastatic melanoma, which does occur. Um, and he made the point that, again, there are many things that seem very similar, but you really want to know specifically what's going on. Um, he also was very important to him about protocols, and I think one of the things at the home meeting in general was people were paying a lot of attention to protocols, so the, and obviously we focus on protocols on CTSS, but his thing was also the importance of thin sections, Sometimes if you're uncertain what's going on, go to the thin sections. He showed some foreign bodies perforations where you saw the collection, but you couldn't tell if it was an ulcer or why. But then when you looked at the thin sections, you would see a foreign body. He showed nice examples, for example, of a wire from grill brushes doing perforations. So he showed those very, very nicely. Um, he also made the point that, uh, you know, when we think about the acute abdomen, we spend a lot of time thinking about appendicitis and pancreatitis and uh, ischemic colitis and all the usual things. But he made the point that you really want to think about also what medications the patients are on. Diffusely thickened bowel, think of ACE inhibitors. He showed examples of patients with lupus enteritis, for example. And he made the point that you need to consider drug reactions as one of the differential diagnosis. And often we don't talk about that or suggest that because we don't have the history of the medication. So it's something good to think about. Um, he also commented about things that look like abscesses, often aren't abscesses, necrotic tumors is something to think about. Um, he spoke about bleeding, like biliary cyst adenomas, cyst adenocarcinomas. So we had a number of different really good teaching points in that regard. The third speaker I'll talk about is Ella Kazaruni. And uh, Ella just gave a terrific talk. She gave some terrific talks on lung cancer screening, uh, but I won't go over those. But I will go over her talk or a little bit some of the points about high resolution CT and interstitial lung disease. She spoke about some of the challenges with making certain you have a good study if the patient's in expiratory, not taking a deep breath, you can tend to overcall things. Motion and confusion with ground glass attenuation, for example, is the pathology real or not? She spoke about some of the classic things like UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia, commenting irregular septal lines and honeycombing, lower lungs greater than upper lobes and the subpleural distribution, uh, and the fact is UIP is one of the things you can diagnose. Uh, it can be primary or in secondary. It's often due to collagen vascular disease or drug toxicity. She spoke about uh, nonspecific interstitial pneumonias, talking about their ground glass appearance, talking about the presence of bronchiectasis. Again, a lower, greater than upper lung predominance, but they had no honeycombing. <laughs> So she showed some very nice examples of this NSIP, or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, which she felt was often diagnosable. She spoke also about bringing up something we often forget, about hypersensitivity pneumonia, that it's very common. Patients are around all sorts of allergens. People are becoming, it seems that we're seeing more of this type of process. She spoke about the fact that hypersensitivity pneumonia is typically diffuse, central lobular nodules can occur, ground glass appearance, mosaic attenuation with air trapping, uh, are some of the cl very classic appearances of hypersensitivity pneumonia. But it can be a difficult diagnosis, and unless you think about it, sometimes it comes up in the clinical history, but often the clinical history, patients don't say a whole lot unless they're asked specific questions. So she spoke about that. She also spoke about things like uh, sarcoidosis, you talked about the nodules in sarcoid and the perilymphatic distribution, upper greater than lower lungs, talking about the presence of lymph nodes, often concurrent abdominal involvement, liver spleen, for example. She spoke about early versus late stage sarcoid, where 
nodules a more perilymphatic appearance in the late phase, but also early phase, but that honeycombing and the loss of volume, the fibrosis. She also spoke about things we sometimes don't talk about, crazy paving with alveoloproteinosis, the fact that interstitial changes from amniotorin toxicity typically will also have liver changes with high density structures in the liver. She spoke about lymphangenic spread and some of the malignancies, radiation enteritis. She spoke about lymphatic spread, breast cancer, for example. She spoke also about how there are programs now that really help you. Uh, she talked about uh, different COPD programs that can really help with disease monitoring and some of the visualizations. So I think what you can see is those are only three of the talks. And I spoke about five minutes out of a 40-minute presentation, which gave it no justice, obviously. Um, we had about 26 lectures, which if you weren't there, you missed. Some of them you'll be able to see on CTSS because I'll be doing them, but some you will not see. Most you will not see. So hopefully this helps you a little bit. But again, one of the things I've spoken about in the past is the importance of CME. Our next course is November 15th to 17th, 2018 at Caesars Palace, Las Vegas. And I think if you want to learn something and learn some cool stuff, come see us come November. In the meantime, you can keep watching us here, and we'll fill you full of pearls and utter brilliance. And with that, I hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time.